The Golden Hind the last of its kind, a story quite intriguing I find, let's dive into it, if you don't mind. This is a portion of mythology that will be explored in Hercules The Legendary Journeys during its third season in 1997. At the time, the show was on fire in terms of popularity as part of a killer two-hour block of television from Renaissance Pictures and Universal, airing alongside Xenur, Warrior Princess. With Hercules establishing a more comedic and family-friendly direction in a majority of the episodes, fans were treated with memorable tales throughout the first few seasons. That's not to say that the series lacked any serious-natured episodes, far from it in fact. An episode such as A Rock in a Hard Place comes to mind in this regard. Anyway, you couldn't go wrong with either show, and after the first crossover on the Xena side with Prometheus in 1995, it was only a matter of time before the Hercules crew would produce their own installment. In early 1997, the crossover episode became a reality, debuting as a part of an intense storyline. How did this begin, and where would it take us as viewers? My name is Aaron, bringing you our first topical look on the channel pertaining to, as Bruce Campbell once put it, the show you could watch if you got tired of the girl show. The guy show. This is a tale of the Golden Hind trilogy in Hercules The Legendary Journeys. After the five television films had captured the imagination of viewers across the world in 1994, Renaissance Pictures quickly set to work on a weekly television series further exploring their adaptation of The Son of Zeus. The adventures will begin airing in early 1995. I plan on covering each film and season of Hercules on the channel in the future, so I'll briefly summarize some notable aspects of the show here leading up to the Golden Hind story. The debut episode, The Wrong Path, premiered on January 16th, with perhaps the most shocking of events taking place in the opening minutes. Deianera, Hercules' wife, played by the late Tawny Katane, and their three children are murdered by Herc's vengeful stepmother Hera. Once he defeats the she-demon in a cave, he then dedicates his life to helping out those in need. From here, 12 more episodes were delivered in the initial season. Eolus, played by Michael Hurst, would continue his recurring appearances as Herc's best friend while displaying some extremely comedic martial arts skills reminiscent of Jackie Chan. Salmonius, played by Robert Trevor, would make his first appearance in the second episode entitled Eye of the Beholder, the start of many comedic adventures featuring the entrepreneurial lad, usually when Eolus wasn't involved. The first appearance of Ares, who looked nothing like the late Kevin Smith at the start, in the episode named after him. Sorbo once remarked that this early version of the God of War was an attempt to present the character as an appealing collector's item for children. The episode also marked the debut of Atlanta, played by six-time Miss Olympia Corey Everson, a character who would return in future seasons. Derek and Lila, as previously discussed in my Xena Season 1 video, would first appear in As Darkness Falls as Centaur and Girlfriend of the Centaur, a pairing that invites hasty remarks from most folks around them. This was Lawless's initial sighting in the Legendary Journeys after appearing in the first telefilm. Nemesis, played here by Karen Witter, also appears for the first time in Pride Comes Before a Brawl as a past love interest to the son of Zeus. And look, it's the totally Kiwi producer Eric Grundemann. Lucy Liu makes an appearance alongside Nathaniel Lees, Manus from Xena's Dreamworker, in the episode The March to Freedom, and takes part in some cool fight scenes. Alcmini, Hercules' mother, is first played by Elizabeth Hawthorne in this series and appears in quite a few episodes. Bruce Campbell makes his directorial debut with the episode The Vanishing Dit, the first of many he would direct. This episode was also the initial sighting of the man who would eventually play Hades in the series, Eric Thompson. And of course, the three-episode arc with the warrior princess concludes the season on a high note. Season 2 of Hercules began on the same night Xena Warrior Princess aired Chariots of War, September 11th, 1995. This would be our introduction to the Autolycus character, as the King of Thebes gets Aeolus in a heap of trouble after villagers from the Kingdom of Cyros spot Hercules' best friend with a box of jewels originally stolen by Autolycus. Of course I like this episode, what do you think? Gosh! Michael Hurst's wife, Jennifer Ward Leland, makes her first appearance in the series a week later in a fun casino-themed episode. 
in another installment directed by Don't Call Him Ash, the late Kevin Smith makes his first appearance in the legendary journeys as Herc's half-brother, Ephicles. In this one, Ephicles doesn't possess anywhere near the confidence or determination we would see portrayed later on when Smith took the role of the God of War. The low-rent Hercules, as Hearst jokingly recalls Smith was named on set during the filming process, pretends to be his brother to win the heart of his love interest, Rena. Liddy Holloway also makes her debut as Hercules' mother Alchemini and would remain in the role from here. Derek and Lila return in Outcast, now married and with a child named Kiefer. And yes, there is a cheeky moment where Hercules and Salmonius point out Lila's stunning resemblance to someone we know. The first appearance of Echidna, no not Knuckles, takes place in The Mother of All Monsters, portrayed by Bridget Offman. Not only that, but her accomplice to get some revenge on the son of Zeus for slaying several of her children is none other than John Kreese! Martin Cove. Fear does not exist in this dojo. Do Echidna would return and cast the giant shadow, the episode that introduced her lover, the giant known as Typhon, played by Glenn Shaddix. And then, the other side. Hercules gets a chance to visit his family in the Elysian Fields while solving a rift between Hades, Persephone, and Demeter in a retelling of the mythological tale. The boat dude, Sharon, also makes a funny appearance here, one of the season's highest points for sure. Teresa Hill, the second and my personal favorite nemesis, debuts in The Fire Down Below and makes another appearance in the classic Terminator-like episode featuring Karen Shepard, the Enforcer. Once a Hero is a retelling of the story of Jason and the Argonauts, with Jeffrey Thomas playing the king and some familiar faces from another show playing his comrades. Robert Tapper directs this installment to great results. Eolus shines in Heedless Hearts, where he gains the ability to predict the future after being struck by lightning and in King for a Day, the episode where we discover that he, like the warrior princess, is physically identical to a person of royalty. It is Prince Orestes, an indulgent degenerate of a fellow who was drugged in order to prevent the marriage that would make him king from taking place. Aeolus poses as the prince to fulfill the wedding ceremony and carries out his duties with honor and nobility, winning the heart of Queen Niobe. This is one of my favorite episodes of the entire series. The Olympics were officially created by the son of Zeus in Let the Games Begin, another fun episode involving Salmonius and the returning Atlanta. And finally, the goddess of love makes her appearance known by way of clamshell surfing in Kevin Sorbo's first directorial piece, The Apple, Holy Aphrodite. This one is tubular, the first of many enjoyable appearances on both shows by Alexandra Tidings. While we're at it, we should commend Eolus for inventing the art of surfing. Enter Season 3. Michael Hurst makes his directorial debut in the first episode called Mercenary, one of the finest installments of the entire series. This one includes a fine actor from the Xena episode, A Fistful of Dinars, Jeremy Roberts. Following this is Hercules battling two versions of a prehistoric mech known as Megalith, Aphrodite taking a holiday from being the goddess of love, a mummy being slayed in time for Halloween, Karen Shepard returning in the superb sequel to the original Enforcer episode where she faces her successor, played by Cynthia Rothrock, Herc and Eolus helping to babysit Echidna and Typhon's newest child, and Carl Urban making his first appearance as Aphrodite's son, Cupid. This leads us to the episode Prince Hercules, airing on November 5th, 1996. The initial sighting of the woman who would eventually play the Golden Hind and become Kevin's wife, Sam Jenkins. A guest star appearance that seems to have been destined to happen. Leading up to the production of the episode, Kevin recalls, I'm in bed one night flipping channels and I stopped on Sequest! Sam humorously interjects, Steven Spielberg's deal. And boom, there I see her. She had shorter black hair with multicolored face paint on. I'm going, eh, chick's kinda hot. I watched the rest of the show just because of her. And then it was one to two years later, we worked together. 
In this episode, Jenkins plays Princess Kirin, the next in line to the throne of the Queen, Parnassa. The Queen is the latest of Hera's minions, hatching a plan to have the son of Zeus suffer from amnesia in order to make him believe he's actually Kirin's husband and father of their two sons, Prince Milius. Once Herc fully believes this facade, the Queen then determines he would pledge allegiance to Hera during an impending equinox and forever be under her spell. The plan is underway when Hercules is struck in the head thanks to a lightning bolt from his wicked stepmother. The Queen threatens to kill the princess and her sons if she does not comply. Kirin is understandably hesitant while executing her objective, informing the son of Zeus that he is indeed married with two children and he can't remember much of anything due to the effects from the war. While away from the princess, Herc is guided by the Queen's second in command, Lonius, who claims assassins from Gorgas are all over the place. Meanwhile, Eolus, who has gone purple at a festival during one of the competitions, goes out to look for his best friend. When the purple man learns of Herc's situation, he does all he can to help the prince regain his memory, only to get knocked out more than once. After the princess is overwhelmed with guilt over falling in love with Herc during the facade, she and Aeolus enter the scene of his pledge to Hera under disguise and finally break through to him thanks to a dream he had of his real fallen wife and the sound of her name. With the queen taken out and her men conquered, the episode ends with an emotional Kirin sharing a kiss with Hercules. Another enjoyable episode from the season, especially when everyone keeps asking Aeolus why he's purple. After the episode's production, Zorbo had gone on to star in Cole the Conqueror. During filming, he noted that Robert Tapper called him and asked what he thought of bringing Jenkins back for an upcoming trilogy retelling the story of the Golden Hind. The executive producer was pleased with the chemistry between the two in her first appearance. Sorbo, who had been pursuing a relationship with Jenkins at this time, feigned disinterest and said, yeah, she was okay. I think she would be a good choice. With this, Jenkins was cast again, and filming of the trilogy took place throughout November and December in 1996. The first episode, Encounter, written by Jerry Patrick Brown and directed by Charlie Haskell, aired on February 10th, 1997. Our story begins in the woods with this lad seemingly hunting down a buck. The hunter quickly becomes the hunted, as this extraordinary creature displays excellent archery skills. Meanwhile, Hercules and Eolus are in the middle of a rumble in a pub. As the golden hunter tosses pots and mugs at the brawlers, the son of Zeus uses a table as a steel chair and even clocks reinforcements with their own weapons, resulting in some amazing stunts. With Hercules possessing his superhuman strength, it was common to see thugs crashing through walls and flying high in the air after being crushed by one of his fists. I never got tired of witnessing how wild these stunts would get over time. Credit to all the stunt folk. Anyhow, after a fun slobber knocker, a local villager named Hemner informs our heroes of a doe, a deer, a female deer living in the woods. According to Sorbo, Michael Hurst could not stop cracking up in between takes from this exact moment. And you can tell, the episode does cut immediately to this shot, making that story even funnier. Anyway, with so many people looking to hunt down the hind, it is Hemner's goal to save her before it's too late, and our heroes agree to help. We then cut to the debut of the Ares who looks exactly like the late Kevin Smith in The Legendary Journeys, sitting on the throne of his temple. He is informed by the Golden Hind of numerous savage lads invading the woods looking to kill her. The God of War reminds her that it was he who saved her when the rest of her kind were slaughtered and has since adequately prepared her to deal with situations like this. The Hind is ordered to take care of the crazy lads and if need be, his half-brother. After the opening credits, we see one of the men who is fixated on slaying the Hind in the Temple of Ares. Prince Nestor, the man who played Damon in The Prodigal from Season 1 of Xena, Steve Hall, returns to portray the bloodthirsty prince. Ares reappears at Nestor's command to assist him in locating the Hind so he could use her blood, the kryptonite of the gods, to kill the son of Zeus. One of the people who likes the sound of that is the debuting nephew of the God of War, Strife, portrayed by Joel Tobek. This lad's performance is incredibly entertaining. Ares gives the prince's blessing and off Nestor goes, setting up traps with his men in the woods. 
Of course our heroes are too good for that crap, avoiding these threats with ease. Except this one. Balls. Thanks to this giant tree branch from the son of Zeus, Aeolus escapes certain groin doom. Some of Nestor's men locate the Golden Hind and are cordially welcomed with arrows to the chest. As the survivors retreat, a frightened little boy runs through the woods and gets tangled up by... Oh no. Nestor! He's only a boy! laments the son of Zeus. Suddenly, a beautiful woman named Serena appears and Herc is in awe. She gingerly keeps her distance from Hercules as she makes her way to the young victim, reviving him to Herc's amazement. When the boy runs away in fear, Serena is astonished when she realizes the son of Zeus is holding on to her. The two share a warm moment together before the woman disappears at the sound of Nestor's men. A short time later, Iolus manages to locate the hind. When he attempts to close in on her, the last of her kind swiftly changes position and aims directly at Iolus. Ignoring the Golden Hunter's wishes to help, the Golden Hind scores a direct hit to his chest with a poison arrow. The son of Zeus quickly brings his friend to Hemner and begins his search for the healer. Back at the Temple of Ares, uncle and nephew are discussing the Hind's blood. Ares is hesitant to use any of it directly against the gods, while Strife revels over the idea of taking out Hercules to gain a heavy rep. Tolbeck's facial expressions here are right up there with Robert Trevor as Salmonius. Ares' growing annoyance towards his nephew is also hysterical. Meanwhile, as Aeolus' health continues to deteriorate, Hercules locates Serena near the Temple of Ares. It is revealed that the healer serves the God of War to the chagrin of his half-brother. Herc informs her of the state of his best friend and asks for her to help him. Shocked at this revelation, Serena regretfully declines to head into the town and fulfill Herc's request. I wonder why? Shortly after, Nestor's men are still roaming the woods as Hercules suddenly locates the Golden Hind. She runs away from him only to be surrounded by Nestor's soldiers. As they are about to overwhelm her, Hercules arrives to the scene and bodies fly everywhere! With most of his forces neutralized, Nestor has had enough of this crap and retreats. Serena once again emerges from the trees and is somehow inclined to help Aeolus out of nowhere. I wonder why? Back at Hemner's place, Serena keeps her word, healing the Golden Hunter in only a few seconds. As he awakens, he lays a hand on Serena, immediately causing her to panic. Oh, that's why. The secret is revealed. Serena and the Hind are one, with the former transforming into the latter whenever a mortal lays a hand on her. This is why Serena was so hypnotized earlier when Hercules was able to touch her with no repercussions. Despite her allegiance to the God of War, Herc pledges to help. The next morning, Iolus is feeling like a million dinars as he eats a heavy breakfast. The son of Zeus informs him that his vision of Serena did in fact occur and he sets off to find her so they can meet. In the woods, the Golden Hind is quickly engulfed inside a thorny dome of doom by the God of War. Ares assures her that this is only for her protection against Hercules. Could have fooled us with her being cut a few times. Hercules frees Serena from the dome, but Ares' work is done. He gathers a piece of the dome with the Hind's blood and donates it to Nestor. Herc and Serena continue to blossom their newfound relationship before Aeolus returns, causing the healer to disappear yet again. Two of Nestor's men swing in on ropes before Hercules can inform his best friend of the truth behind Serena and the Hind. Another excellent fight ensues, with our heroes kicking loads of ass. I love when Hercules commandeers this horse to clock this lad off his horse, and when the heroes perform killer tag team moves. As the battle rages on, Nestor sets his sights on the son of Zeus in a shot that resembles your typical 90s first-person shooter. Hercules is not pleased with your lame aim, Nestor. Suddenly, one of Nestor's archers is taken out in the trees. It's the Hind! With the prince stating the obvious on Herc and the Hind working together, he decides to bounce and shoves his general down. This part was too funny. With Nestor running wild in the woods, brother, he receives a good dose of karma by one of his own traps. In the end, as Hercules and Serena celebrate their victory with kisses, Ares and Strife rejoice over everything working out just right. And here's another reason why these disclaimers rule. 
Part 2, When a Man Loves a Woman, written by the duo of Gene O'Neill and Noreen Tobin, and directed once again by Haskell, aired a week later. The story continues with Eolus looking to quench his thirst near a well. Loco bozos don't appreciate his efforts, leading to another fun melee as Eolus hurls the big mouth lad down the well. Hercules joins the battle when the thugs refuse to forgive, and you guessed it, BODIES FLY EVERYWHERE! <laughs> There's also an extremely hilarious moment when the son of Zeus swings his best friend around as a weapon to Aeolus' dismay. Look at his face as this is happening! As if it couldn't get any funnier, Aeolus punches the lad originally thrown down the well as he's attempting to climb out during the scuffle. After the last body crash lands on a roof from Herc's smash impact, the son of Zeus grabs that same lad looking to escape well hell and tosses him back in there for good. Such a great opening. Meanwhile, at the Temple of Ares, the God of War and his nephew discuss Serena's whereabouts. Despite Herc and Serena's growing relationship, Ares remains confident, knowing it was him who saved the Hind from extinction. Strife is commanded to keep an eye on those two as their affection increases. Soon after, the Golden Hind is participating in target practice. When she hears someone in the distance, she shoots towards the trees. Of course, Herc is too good for that crap. The Hind reverts back to Serena, and the son of Zeus wastes no time in proposing to her with a necklace. Serena hesitantly declines, stating that she belongs to the God of War. Hercules retorts by stating she belongs to no one but herself, and asks her to think it over. Back in the town, as Aeolus and Hemner pull on a rope tied to a large barrel, ARE YOU READY FOR A CAMEO? It is Joxer the Might- I mean, the Magnificent? Joxer is looking for adventure with the son of Zeus, and luckily, he has found Herc's best friend. As the Magnificent prepares to assist the others with the barrel, he falls into this trough, paying homage to his typical clumsiness on Zener. Back at Ares' temple, the Golden Hind is discussing Hercules' proposal with the God of War. Their negotiation is brought to the brink of a quarrel as she is prepared to fight him for the chance to be with Hercules. Ares eventually reconsiders his position in their arrangement and lets her go. A befuddled Strife inquires Ares on his line of thinking. You ever hear of the Trojan Horse? Asks Ares. Back at the town, progress with the barrel is ongoing until Hercules finally shows up and saves everyone valuable time. As Joxar meets the son of Zeus for the first time, Serena arrives to the town while maintaining her distance from the citizens. Herc ties the rope to a pole and runs over to Serena faster than a barefoot jackrabbit on a hot greasy griddle in the middle of August. The Hind returns the necklace back to Hercules and affirms she has chosen to stay with Ares. Psych! She says she'll need that necklace back when Herc marries her. Looks like the son of Zeus has a wedding date. Their romantic elation is quickly interrupted by that stupid barrel. When Herc is about to pull once more, the rope snaps and insanity ensues. Joxar asks the citizens to stay back as our heroes work to save this poor lad from certain doom, and great he touched her. This old lad initiates an all-out charge on the hind. Now Hercules is in quite the pickle. Save the lad from being strangled, or save his golden fiance. Both parties end up being saved as Hercules puts nifty projectiles to good use and sends each of the lads holding the hind down by rope flying to Never Never Land. These dudes were so lucky Joxer didn't take care of them himself. The old lad from earlier proves to be Strife, manipulating the scuffle all along. We then get a lovely montage between the two lovers, ranging from serious discussion to pure adoration. As Yola grabs a bite to eat in a pub, the son of Zeus informs him of Serena turning into the hind at the touch of a mortal and his intention to marry her. The Golden Hunter responds by letting his friend know he has a bad feeling about this with Ares' involvement. Herc suddenly remembers Deonera and decides to let her know about Serena. Unfortunately, Aeolus declines Herc's offer to be the best man. Why? Serena then guides Hercules to the entrance, to the other side. As the son of Zeus searches for his family, Joxer is overwhelmed by the same goons from earlier looking for retribution. When the Magnificent is hurled at some kitchen supplies, Aeolus comes to the rescue in another funny scene. Back at the Elysian Fields, Herc's family is excited to see him again. Asking his children to give him and their mother a few minutes alone, Hercules delivers the news to his late wife. 
As you might expect, shockwaves of anguish rattle her to the core. Two of his children arrive back in the frame, wondering where Herc's third child, Aeson, has gone. The son of Zeus locates him in the depths of Tartarus, and Aeson makes his disapproval of the upcoming wedding clear by cutting his father on the arm. Hercules smells a rat, pondering how his son could possibly know about Serena. It turns out to be Strife playing mind games once again with the son of Zeus. The real Aeson is found safe shortly after. As Serena continues waiting for Hercules, Ares does all he can to sway her back over to him, but to no avail. Back in the fields, Deianera is still in disbelief, grieving over her husband's decision to remarry. Hercules makes it clear that marrying Serena will never change the love he will always have for her or their children. Excellent scene between the two here. Hercules then returns to his golden fiance, determined to live a new life with her. With Strife's mind game still fresh in his head, Herc infiltrates the Temple of Ares to have a conversation with his half-brother. Ares notes that since Herc is half-god, and Serena possesses kryptonite to the gods in her veins, their offspring would either be supremely powerful beings, or combust before their very eyes. Not taking any chances, the God of War gives Hercules a choice. Give up his superhuman strength, or give up Serena. I choose Serena, fumes Hercules. With that, Ares confiscates the strength from our hero. Back in the town, that stupid barrel is finally held in place, as Joxer asks Aeolus to go on adventures together. Hercules returns to his best friend, learning that his plan to set off on his own still stands. Joxer continues his sales pitch by demonstrating his superior weapon skills, by cutting off the rope to the barrel. Round two against the barrel begins, this time with Herc having a heck of a time preventing it from crushing two little boys. When Joxer knocks himself out by running face first into the barrel, the rest of the citizens jump in to help the son of Zeus. Confused at Herc's sudden inability to handle the heavy object, Aeolus is not pleased when he finds out why. Meanwhile in the woods, Serena is back in hind mode, as Ares is not done dishing out ultimatums. Either Serena gives up being the Golden Hind, or gives up Hercules. The last of her kind chooses the son of Zeus, leaving Ares visibly shaken when he turns her into a mortal. Hercules and Aeolus exchange their goodbyes in the pub, promising each other to stay in touch. Joxer's hopes of adventuring with the Golden Hunter are tossed out the window when he disrespects Hercules for not having his powers anymore. At last, the wedding is ready to begin. While Herc and Serena state their vows in front of Mother Nature, Yolos interrupts and fulfills Herc's request to be the best man. The couple resume their vows as Hercules' family looks on from above. The episode is sealed with a kiss and Deianira's blessing. This proved to be the last appearance of each of Hercules' late family members in this series. Written by Robert B. Lack and directed by Gus Draconis, aired a week later. The newly married couple are enjoying themselves tremendously. In the middle of their jubilation, the decision is made to reunite with Eolus. Where else were we find our two heroines hanging out for a meal besides a pub? At this time, the second season of Xena Warrior Princess was going strong, with Gabrielle once again changing her look into the one the fans would be most familiar with. I like to refer to it as the money bra outfit. Anyhow, these two old drunks ceremoniously gloat over Hercules surrendering his superhuman strength to marry his new wife. Xena is left in disbelief, springing her into action. Gabrielle humorously suspects a hint of jealousy from the warrior princess as they set off to locate the son of Zeus. The drunk bastards continue their loud ramblings until the two heroines are out of sight. Suddenly, it's clear how these two knew that vital plotline information. It was Ares and Strife, shape-shifting yet again. Meanwhile, Hercules and Serena make their way into town and are greeted with heinous remarks from some goons. When they refuse to apologize, the son of Zeus sticks up for his wife by instigating a brawl. Without his strength, however, Hercules is unable to dominate his opponents in his trademark fashion. The Golden Hunter bursts onto the scene and helps clear out the goons, jumping on a two of them and punching them silly. Even Serena demolishes a lad. Now with the odds evened out a bit, Hercules is able to jab his way into an apology from the loudmouth to his wife. 
However, Hercules is left angered with their interference, noting he may not have all of his strength, but he's not some helpless, impotent old man who can't fight his own battles. His unnatural vitriol is then explained by strife roaming around the area undetected. Once Ares' nephew disappears, Herc regains his composure. Strife returns to his uncle and summarizes what happened earlier in the town. The God of War is excited as they stand on the same ground where one of his great conquests took place with Xena at his side. You miss her, don't you? asks Strife. Meanwhile, the married couple and Aeolus are talking things over in a pub. In the town square, a new water system dedicated to the son of Zeus is proposed by this elder lad, none other than Xena cast member Huntley Elliot from Sins of the Past. The undetected Strife doesn't like the sound of that, zapping a villager into resentment towards Hercules. This lad is able to convince the others into demanding his exile by emphasizing his recent unstable behavior and decision to marry a half-breed. In the evening, Hercules and Serena are enjoying a romantic time together while Strife continues his shenanigans outside. These shots of him prancing around as he closes in onto their home are so good. Excellent job by Tobek. As the couple doze off into the night, Hercules begins tossing and turning uncontrollably. We see his nightmare of a venomous argument between him and his wife. Serena questions whether or not Hercules can adequately protect her without his powers, and even mentions his late family, pushing him deeper and deeper into a rage. When she dares him to hit her, Hercules suddenly awakens the next morning to a far worse situation. With blood on his hands, he discovers a blade and a stab wound on his wife's abdomen. Aeolus and some of the town's citizens make their way to Herc's home, and the son of Zeus is heard screaming in the distance. The hunter sprints his way in to find his best friend in despair over his dead wife. The citizen zapped by strife uses this as further evidence to elicit Herc's permanent exile from their town. Aeolus and the townsfolk are angrily demanded to leave by the son of Zeus. Then, Ares is seen with the fates, itching to cut Hercules' lifeline. Suddenly, one of the many Zeuses in the series, Peter Veer Jones, makes his presence known and prevents Ares from proceeding. This marks the first appearance of Zeus in the legendary journeys. Since the couple agreed to become mortals prior to their marriage, Zeus decrees that Hercules shall get a trial as a mortal as he is seen destroying tons of furniture in his home. Shortly after, Herc pays respect to his fallen wife before Aeolus suggests him to run since the town is now convinced Serena was killed by the son of Zeus. The chase is on, with poor Aeolus being stomped on as the townsfolk dash after Hercules. The hunter is able to stop them momentarily on a horse before they all proceed back into town with Aeolus volunteering to speak with his friend about surrendering. Herc finds this elder lad, Veklos, who invites him to hide inside his home. The zapped citizen enters the home but is suddenly hesitant to look any further when Veklos asserts Hercules ran off to the woods. The visible grief from the son of Zeus convinces Veklos of his innocence. Herc sneaks out and makes a run for it, but Strife is there to cackle like the Joker and zap the same lad again into resuming the chase. As Herc runs away, he trips over a rope and the townsfolk swarm in on him yet again. An archer shoots him in the chest, and Aeolus is quickly restrained. How will they ever get out of this mess? <laughs> Xena and Gabrielle arrive, and we witness a killer battle with Strife giggling to himself out of sight. I have to be honest, I probably did this more than once myself. Everybody gets in on the action, including our bard of Ponidia. This moment is super good. Incredible combative exchanges. After clearing out the goons, Hercules falls over in exhaustion as the effects from the arrow to his chest earlier begin to take their toll. Aeolus, Xena, and Gabrielle transport Hercules to this cave, and the healer princess does her thing. When the young bard goes off to fetch some water, Aeolus informs Xena of everything. Herc did, in fact, give up his strength to be with Serena, who is now dead, with the whole town thinking he did it. The warrior princess is stunned at this revelation. Aeolus then goes outside and shares another moment with Gabrielle, noting the bloody blade beside Hercules in his bed. Inside the cave, Hercules and Xena begin discussing the events up to this point. The son of Zeus mentions the nightmares leading up to Serena's death, and the warrior princess suspects the gods at work, specifically the God of War. 
Xena urges Hercules to stay put until his injury heals and he dozes off once again. The young bard returns and is flummoxed at Aeolus' behavior. When Xena meets him outside, he proceeds to vent on the situation. If Herc were to surrender under such false pretenses, his entire reputation and line of work would go down the river. As the two contemplate the best course of action with the possibility of the gods at play, Hercules has another nightmare where he kills Serena. He awakens near Deaner, I mean Gabrielle, in a cold sweat. As she fetches more water, the injured Herc slowly walks over to Xena's sword and sneaks out with it. When the other three heroes come back, Aeolus fears his best friend has decided to die a warrior's death. All of this is being spied on by Ares and Strife, who couldn't be any more pleased with how things are going. Back in the town, Hercules dares anyone to come and get some. Aeolus, Xena, and Gabrielle arrive to stop the son of Zeus. When Aeolus refuses to step aside, he and his best friend duke it out and... Aeolus actually wins. You killed me, utters Hercules as he falls down. Did. No! Screams the warrior princess as she angrily grabs her sword and goes after the hunter. The scuffle quickly ends with Xena killing Aeolus. Evil Xena returns, asking the crowd if they want to see any more bloodshed. Rejoicing at the death of his half-brother and her return to the dark side, Ares appears with his nephew in hysterics. When Ares refuses to explain what in Tartarus is going on, Strife takes on the task himself. It was indeed Ares' nephew who caused Strife in Hercules' head and caused him to kill Serena under his spell. Clearly not pleased with Strife revealing this information, Ares' day is further stomped on when Hercules and Aeolus rise from the dead. In actuality, the whole thing was a setup in order for Xena to get the gods to confess in front of the townsfolk. Now with a clear perpetrator in their midst, the son of Zeus charges at Strife for an ass whooping of a lifetime. By God, Hercules is raising Tartarus all over the God of War's nephew. When Strife is unsure what to do next, Uncle Ares reminds him that he's a god and to use his powers already. With renewed vigor, Strife turns the tides on Hercules, demolishing him with ease. Xenor demands Ares to give Herc his powers back, but of course, the God of War is having none of that crap. As Strife continues to double stomp on Hercules in hilarious fashion, Veklos emerges from his home and demands Ares to play fair. Somehow, this elder lad gives Hercules his powers back, but how? Oh, it's Zeus. That Strife boy is screwed, man. Bodies fly everywhere! Ares is not amused. The slobber knocker goes into the barn, out of the barn with a killer stunt, and resumes in the town square with the son of Zeus bam bam slamming strife on the ground over and over again with one arm. This sequence is brilliant. When Ares can't take it anymore, he zaps his half-brother off his nephew and with a last joker-like cackle, strife disappears. Ares, this isn't over, remarks Hercules. No, retorts Ares, it isn't. Hercules goes after his father and demands he bring Serena back to life. Zeus states he can't undo what the gods have done, to the dismay of his son. After a half-hearted thank you to his father for giving his powers back, Hercules asserts the rift between them isn't over either. Our four heroes regroup as Aeolus jokes he would have been killed by Xena if her sword stab was a few more inches off. The trilogy ends in a way that still gives me goosebumps. Serena's funeral is accompanied by Xena's burial theme, slightly modified for the legendary journeys. The son of Zeus pounds Serena's necklace onto her gravestone. Before he does, the hardest part of letting go, saying goodbye. That shall conclude our look back at this memorable trilogy from The Guy Show. The excitement leading up to Judgment Day in 1997 was palpable, and the episode delivered in a big way. The story of a possessed Hercules killing Serena was based on the actual mythological tale of Heracles killing his first wife, Megara, under the evil Hera's control. This would not be the first or last time characters from Xena would cross over to the legendary journeys, but it was the final time we would see all four heroes from both shows presented in this fashion at the same time. 
This, according to Mr. Tappert, was largely due to the studio not wanting to continue paying for more crossovers. It's a shame, really. This episode, along with Prometheus from Xena, truly are some of the coolest moments in the entire mythos, and there certainly was potential for more thrilling adventures with each of the four on screen at once. Nevertheless, each episode from the trilogy is enjoyable to this day, and it's only a taste of many more fun installments between our favorite characters on both shows. It also wouldn't be the last we'd see of Serena, but that's another story. On the subject of the trilogy overall, Michael Hurst stated, That was a powerful story arc, to have Herc get married and then again to lose his wife. Sam Jenkins, who plays Serena, brought a really special quality to that role. Kevin and Sam had met on the set of Prince Hercules. He was really quite struck by her. I was saying, wow, watch this develop. And I was right. And finally, Kevin Sorbo, having enjoyed Judgment Day the most out of the trilogy, stated, I liked playing the scene where Serena dies, the exchanges I had with Eolas, the fight scene with Ares and Strife, and the final scene, saying goodbye to her at the grave site. I thought it was a strong, emotional episode, and a good chance for me to bite my acting chops into something different from the normal Hercules show.